Bear with us about 30 seconds, please. Those types of uh, lectures, conversations, usually start off with, start off, and in this industry, we like one-liners. We have several. We have four or five of the most famous one-liners in the world. Take my wife, please. Retail electrical deregulation from retail electricity profits. Those are all funny unless you're in my business. But of course, there is one one-liner. Every time we hear it, we heard it being discussed this morning. California utility deregulation. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I mean, these guys have made a mockery, a mockery of all their ratepayers, a mockery of the country, and they're still making a mockery of it. There is no retail market in California of any value whatsoever, and probably will not be into the foreseeable future. Now, one of the problems that we've had all this way through, there is an argument, why do we need deregulation? People are saying, this, this thing isn't broken. Um, we should really leave it alone. Retail deregulation is not necessary. Deregulation in any form is not necessary. And if we go back to how we ended up in this particular situation was that during the 20s and 30s, uh, people like Sam Insol, Insol companies held operating companies, and operating companies held other operating companies. And this is a very simple diagram of how this was done. In actual fact, it's very simple because a third tier company could hold 10% of a second tier company. And the second tier company, you can get this thing to work. Yeah. It worked before. Oh, the other way around. <laughs> third tier company could hold um, an interest in that company, that company could hold an interest in this company, this company could hold an interest in that company. And before you knew it, you had this kind of amorphous piece of paper with about 60 or 70 different companies on, and nobody knew who owned who. In actual fact, when he was testifying in front of Congress in the 30s, they asked Sam Insel, you know, how did it work, and he explained to them that he, he used to take power from Dayton Power and Light and transmit it into uh, Chicago, and that was a very good system. And one of the senators turned around and said, look, Mr. Insel, he said, we know where the BTU goes and we know where the kilowatt hours go. It's where does the money go that we're interested in at the moment. And they decided that they couldn't find that out, so they broke this up. And we had a new compact. We had public utilities that were regulated by the states and to some extent by the government, and they were allowed to make a profit on a rate of return basis. Now, providing problem, but we discovered in the 50s and 60s that these things started to swing apart from each other. Rates of return started to get higher, and interest rates remained, except for a little period with Jimmy Carter, remained pretty stable. Now, if this was the only way you could make money, you had to exploit it. If you were a good manager, if you could borrow money at 6% and get 14 to 15% on your asset, that was a smart thing to do. It's a no-brainer. So if you were going to build a power station that was going to cost $1 billion, why build it for $1 billion? Why not build it for $2 billion or $3 billion? It became the most inefficient use of capital this country's probably ever seen. We have some monuments standing out there like Shoreham that cost $7 billion, supposed to cost $800 million, never produced a kilowatt of electricity. Now, if you can tell me that that's a non-quick operation and this system is working, I don't agree. And so we moved along and we decided that we were going to try and fix the system. When we looked at the system, we discovered it just wasn't investor-owned utilities. We had the federal government involved in this thing. When they were doing the deregulation or the re-regulation in the 30s, we had the rural electrification system. We had TVA. We had Bonneville. Because the investor-owned utilities were not going to serve those people in the outback. So 
the government got involved. We also had municipals, and then we had rurals. So we've got all that mix that's still out there, not part of the system, not part of what we're talking about. Am I doing this right? No, no one. Okay. The industrial utilities, however, is however 206. I've lost count. They're all merging now. And by the time this is through, we'll see there's going to be a lot less of them. But there's the county, so there's about 260 of these guys. They are the predominant owners of the generation and transmission facilities. And then outside that, believe it or not, we've got about 1,000 cuts over the period of time. Not many people know how many. We do. Now you do. 1,232, I counted them the other day before I made this slide up. <laughs> and there are none other generating generators. Now, this is an interesting number. These none other generators usually are not in the pattern of things. There are companies like Archer Daniel Midland, uh, some of the uh, paper companies that have put generators in in the past, a long time ago. They got fed up with the local utility that screw it, I'm going to put my own in. And so there's a lot of generators out there that are not part of this. They're not part of the stranded investment either, which is very interesting. So there are major benefits from deregulation. One of the benefits, we're going to have, we're going to have, we're going to have a major increase in efficiency of energy. If we've seen over the past 20 years the average power station efficiency rise from 28% to 56%, it's doubled. And we've still got a stock of stuff out there that's for 28%. That would vanish with deregulation. You can't run a 28% efficiency operation and still make a living in this business. You've got to get your heat rates down to 7,000 BTU or else you're out of business. And so we're going to see a major increase in efficiency use of energy. Hopefully, not yet, hopefully, we're going to see a reduced cost to the customer. We're going to see a radical improvement in the environment because these new power stations are going to be regulated better than the last ones. You're going to put the best technology in or else they won't get permitted. And so we'll see emission rates fall. We're going to see a startling improvement if this is allowed to go forward. And we're going to see the expansion of technology, just like we've seen in all the communications industry, like we're seeing on the Internet, like we're seeing in the computer industry. That's going to happen in our industry as well. And then we're going to see the expansion and improvement of services. You know, there was that lady that used to do the uh, commercial, or no, she did a, a job, I can't remember her name. She used to be, tend to be a telephonist operator working for the utility. And she had a saying, we don't supply service. We are the utility. We do not have to. Our motto, unfortunately, as a non-regulator, we do supply service. We're not the utility. We do have to. And so services will improve all the time in the business. However, the lady earlier on was talking about deregulation. Outside these states, and so, so all the rest of it, really, I don't care. This New England area, going into Ohio, Illinois. And in Illinois, really, I'm only interested in that little bit around the loop. You know, down at the bottom end is, you know, a few cornfields. But... <laughs> now, we go through a process, and there are several players in the process of deregulation. And, of course, there's the utilities. We want fully securitized stranded costs. Our calculation. Don't bring P. Marwick into this. This is, this is our calculation, not yours. We don't want independence. We will tell you what our stranded investments are. That's the number one thing. And we want them securitized. We want the money now. We want it up front. I don't want to wait 10 years to get the money. Give it me now. Also, we would like to keep our power plants in a separate production. You can pay them for us. Uh, we'd like that. But we want to keep them as well. And let's put them in a separate affiliate so we become a power producer. And we'd like to keep all our transmission systems through a separate transco affiliate. You've got to trust us. Look, we ran PGM for, for years. There was us, and there was Pico, and there was PPNL. We did a great job. Why don't you let us do that now? We, we'll, we'll see that it works. 
and then we want to keep all our customers through a retail affiliate. And we'll sell them underpriced power so we'll make sure that we can keep all the other carpet baggers out of the area. And in return, in return, you can take credit for forcing out of us a 5% reduction. You can go to constituents and say, we did it, we got you a 5% reduction. Then of course there's the legislature and the politician, but we got the only problem is make that seven and a half percent. It's an election year this year. Five percent doesn't ring work. Give me seven and a half percent. And we'll go along with the deal. In other words, when we get to the stage where this is going through the legislature, we don't bother at all. It's a, it's pointless interfering, it's pointless intervening, it's pointless saying anything. And the legislature only comes out with a broad brush thing that says we passed it, the customers are going to get 7.5% or they're going to get 10%, we've done a wonderful job for you, and then it goes over to the commission that's got to put in all the rules and regulations. And what's the commission's view? Oh, allow me to do that for you, sir. Allow me to put how I'll get that done for you. I'll write rules and regulations, which I'll implement in. And by the way, um, here's my resume, just in case there's a change of administration, I need a new job. And uh, if you would like to employ me, I think that you'll find that I'm equally subservient. And so we have the three people that are dealing with this, the, um, the utilities, the legislature, and the commission. And then, of course, there's the... <laughs> In every state so far that we've seen, this has been the situation. Probably will continue for some time. But if you're in this business, you understand it. You don't go rushing to commissions and screaming and shouting, because once we get beyond the commission and once everything is supposed to be implemented, then we have another real problem. And I'll illustrate the problem for you like this. New Jersey was the first state to deregulate natural gas, and so we have four utilities, natural gas utilities in New Jersey. You would think at that one stage that we would have a uniform ruling for each of these utilities. Each utility has its own rules, own regulations, has different requirements, different tariffs, different balancing operations, different payment operations, different scheduling. So irrespective of what the state has done, and what the commission has done, you then have to deal with the utility, which has its own rules and regulations. Now, these rules and regulations can vary so widely that you have to set up a process for dealing with each utility at a time. What you do in northern Connecticut at Yankee, how you balance on the Yankee system, and how you balance and nominate on southern, California, uh, southern uh, Connecticut system, are two two entirely different systems, completely and utterly devoid of each other. If you looked at them, you wouldn't think we were doing the same thing. And so after you go through all this, you've still got to deal with the utilities. And then, of course, getting out of the generating business, willing to sell 3,000 barrels of old coal fire capacity. Now, do you remember what we were saying at the beginning? The utility commissions and the, the people saying, well, the stranded investment is $10 billion, but if you sell your plants for $10 billion, the stranded investment goes away. That's book value. Whatever you get over book value, I mean, that's it. I mean, don't make us laugh at book value. All we're dealing with here is ridiculous overpriced bids. You're coming into New England and buying power stations that I wouldn't have offered them scrap value for, and they're paying $2,000 to $3,000 a megawatt, a kilowatt. Doesn't make sense yet, but it will in a little bit later. And then, of course, there's those utilities are going out and buying nukes. That makes a lot of sense to me. I would love to be a president of a company that only owns nukes. I could wake up every night in fear that 60 Minutes is standing on the doorstep with me and the cameras and the lights and said, What happened at nuclear power plant B? And I'm going to say, What? How many people did you kill? And then there's the West Coast utility to which is about the East Coast generating assets, but let's do a swap. So we've got a situation where PG&E are coming over to the West Coast, and we've got the East Coast utilities buying from PG&E, and there must be a method to this madness. We're still figuring it out. And then, of course, 
is the previous speaker referred to, we've got to keep these guys apart. This is what we call an arms length, no length, length legislation that keeps them apart in any way, shape, or form. The only way you're going to achieve this is say, no. You can market anywhere you like in this United States of America, except in your own territory. And that is the only way you're going to keep them apart. Unless you do that, you're wasting your time, you're playing around. It doesn't mean anything. I could know 50 ways with I and the, uh, the utility, and he's my affiliate. I know 50 ways in which I can screw the system like that. And you would never know I've done it. So unless you keep them completely apart, you're not allowed. And I would go as far as saying you're not allowed to market in your own state. Because I don't trust them that far either. Because they make deals with each other. And we know that. However, what we've seen in this market is this. We've seen a lot of them not in the field, give it X million dollars, comes down to the retail market, dumps it in the back hole, and then disappears through the exit door. Now, we don't know how much dumb money there is out there. We figure it's, it's plenty yet to come. But we've seen people like PG&E come over to the East Coast and disappear back to the West Coast. We've seen companies like M1 go jumping into California and jumping out of California. There's a lot of dumb money out there. How long it will last, we don't know. But we think that deregulation will really start to take place when this dumb money starts to disappear. It may take another year, maybe a little, a little less, but we're seeing it beginning, just beginning to dry up. But every time we think that it's gone, we get another idiot coming into the market, selling below market for about six weeks, seven weeks, opening up eight or nine offices, and then start to retract and get that. Then money can last for about another year. And then, of course, there's the mathematics, the mathematics that we tell in the world. Our losses in retail activity, 200 million this year. The economics of the web. This now makes sense. You're the biggest if you lose the most money. Unfortunately, I work for a company that doesn't allow that. We, we, have a, we have another, we, we're kind of old fashioned. I mean, everything we do, we're supposed to make at least a nickel on it. If we don't make a nickel on it, we're in trouble. But that is what the claim to fame is at the moment. Because I have no, I don't know one public sectors that make any money in this business. Who are you? Who? Statoil. You mean in Norway you make money? Okay. I'd like to talk to you if you're making money because um, we've got some money to invest in, in companies that make money. We ain't been able to find one yet, so I'd like to talk to you. I know you make money in the North Sea. I mean, that's, a, that's an old brain. How long will they restructure? It only took a few minutes to get rid of them under the right circumstances. Something came in from outer space and they're gone. Now, I don't expect that to happen that quickly here. But one meteor could do it, and it won't be regulation. And it won't be through deregulation. The way that this is going to happen is when one of those guys adapts and adapts very, very quickly to the new environment. It gets out of its own thinking about what it was and thinks what it should be and what's possible. Is it possible to be in the transmission business? What other money can I make if I'm just in the transmission business? How can I expand that service that I'm so good at doing of repairing wires? And the right time when the right utility suddenly becomes the darling of Wall Street because it's doing all the right things and the share prices start to rise and the dividend starts to rise, we got deregulation. There's a story that goes along where the, in the American or in the uh, baseball league, they were trying to bring in black people into the league for a very long time. And along came Jackie Robinson. And Jackie 
started to hit the ball, and people had never seen a guy like this before. But the fact that Jackie Robinson came into the league at that stage didn't do much. I met an old gentleman from the Monarchs, the old, the old Batman, and he told me a story which is very interesting. He said, there was a writer in the newspapers, in, uh, a sports writer in New York, and he wrote a little poem that changed baseball for all time. He said, Jack is nimble, Jack is quick, Jack is making the turnstiles tick, Jack can hit, and Jack can throw, Jack's making O'Malley a lot of dough. And he said, the next time at the Monarchs, he said, the sea of white faces behind the dugout, watching who were the players that were going to be the next Jackie Robinsons, that was it, it was all over. Because as soon as money came into the equation, that was it. The name of the game was gone. And as soon as these dinosaurs adapt and start making money, real money, which they're capable of doing with their assets, deregulation takes place. Yeah, I think there's also uh, some folks that you still are Going to stop burning as much money as they are. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm not sure that you have to wait five or ten years before that market is going to finally. Oh, no, I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't think we do. I said within the next year, I would say most of the utility affiliates are burning themselves out at a colossal rate at this moment in time. Uh, you've only got to look at the 10Ks or the, or the, the 10Q, the quarterlies. I mean, you can't continue to lose five, 15, 20 million a quarter without somebody saying, hey, wait a minute, this is not what we're supposed to be doing here. And some shareholder or somebody on Wall Street is going to say, look, this is not the way to go. Oh, I agree with that. And it just depends on the rate of birth. Just depends on the rate of birth. We're already seeing it now. They're getting out one after the other are getting out. What's the predicted burn rate in your, in your uh, in a, <laughs> if you look at the numbers and say, you should have Depends on how you know how deep the pocket is to begin with. I mean, there's a great difference between PG&E or Pico and some uh, rural utility, you know, some small utility. Uh, but burn rates vary, and they've been as high as forty million dollars a quarter with some of these companies. And even the biggest company, forty million, is real box. I mean, you can't keep on with that. So depends on the size of the utility, how much they're throwing into it. That's how quickly they'll die because they all sell the wrong market. Yes, sir? Um, electric utilities are becoming more to be commodities business, and you're in the retail end, which is very commodity. And how do you expect to make money in the commodity business unless you're one of the large, major um, commodity producers? And uh, you sell something else. Um, you know? um, production or wholesale and retail don't go well together at all. In fact, it's a failure. You cannot be a wholesaler and a retailer at the same time. I'll tell you why. It's very simple. There's a conflict of interest. We have a different objective than you as the wholesaler. We have the business of buying at the lowest possible price. You as a wholesaler want to sell at the highest possible price. We want to sell at the highest possible price to our customers. You want to sell at the highest possible price. If you are selling to me and I'm your captive supplier, and along comes that oil and says, at this moment in time, I can sell you at a lesser price. I want to buy from him. I don't want to buy from you. I want to buy the lowest because that's my business. On the other hand, if I'm tied with you, I can't get a price from anybody else. Nobody's going to give me a price. I can't go to Stato because Stato said, hey, tied with him. All you'll do is test in the market. We've been through that. With our one supply, we, we were with Chevron for quite some time. And the wholesale and retail markets were fighting each other all the time. How do you make money? You make money because you buy right and you sell right. You buy low and you sell high. For example, I'm giving you a simple example. Wouldn't you go into the Philadelphia market and buy through this summer period and say to a customer, I'm going to give you a 12-month price, knowing full well that you're a mercy and vagaries of the summer period? No. You say to your customer, hold off. Let me come to you in October. I'll give you a shorter contract, but I'll give you a much better price. And there are many ways of beating the system. And that's the, the simple one. But there are many, many ways of beating the system. 
once you're in the business. All commodity retailers and brokers don't go bust. They don't go busting pink bellies. They don't go busting corn. They don't go busting those other commodities. Don't go busting this one either. If you do it right. Don't make foolish mistakes. The, big, the only problem you've got in this business is making that big mistake. You make that big mistake you're out. Nobody can afford the big mistake. What's your they're, they're doing fairly well because market prices are below market prices. Um, you've got affiliates going in and selling below market. And so, for that, that short period of time, they do very well. It's at that period of time, we, we don't go into the market at all. We're registered to do business in Pennsylvania, we don't do business in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we encourage them to take it because it, it serves two purposes. They start to like deregulation and the utility affiliates go bust quicker. <laughs>